the real estate market is absolutely crazy and not in a good way, especially when it comes to condos. The level of inventory is super high. The level of sales is exceptionally low. The prices are going down. New construction projects are being delayed or canceled. And in general, it seems that this whole market is going to hell in a handcart. But at the same time, there are opportunities in any marketplace, including this one. So today I want to look at both sides of the issue and you know, see what problems we have in the marketplace and how we as consumers can take advantage of those opportunities and actually make money or at the very least attempt not to lose money. If we're meeting for the first time, my name is Vlad. I'm a real estate agent with the Purple Tree Real Estate Group. I'm going to provide you with a bunch of information, which I hope is going to be useful for you. And the only thing that I'm asking, I would like to ask in return is you could hit the like button if you like the content and consider subscribing to the channel so that you see all the new releases of the videos that are coming out on a weekly basis. But now let's talk about what's happening in the market. Let's talk about the volume of sales for condos specifically. In September, we sold about 4,500 units. In August, the number was pretty much the same. In October, the number is also pretty similar to 4,500. We're likely going to have the same number of sales in November once the data is released, and then this trend is likely to continue until the end of the year. Now, what's hugely unusual is that normally we see a spike in activity in September after the Labor Day. Didn't happen this year. Summer is one of the slowest periods of the year in real estate, and August is a dead month. Everybody knows this, both consumers and real estate agents. So if we had approximately 4,500 units sold in August, we would have a fantastical spike in early September after everybody's back in town, parents are back at work, kids are back in school, and now the adults are busying themselves thinking about what they need to do with their real estate holdings. Do they sell, do they buy, or do they invest? So all of that creates a lot of activity, which we didn't see this year at all. The market is completely flat, and it seems that it's dead. Some things are selling, but there's been a huge decline in condo sales since the beginning of the year. Now, year to date, we had a 47% decline as compared to the same period of time for 2022, which is super substantial. And there are several reasons for that, of course. One of them is interest rates. Another one is renewals, right? People that are renewing their mortgages. General uncertainty in the marketplace is yet another one. So buyers are not sure if they need to dive into the deep end right now and shell out all of the money that they have saved up and start purchasing, thinking that maybe this is the best and most opportune time for them to get the better deal. Or maybe they should wait for a few months until next year, or maybe they should wait at the very least till the announcement in December. Maybe the interest rates will go up again. Well, anyways, the buyer is uncertain as to what to do. And of course, builders and developers are very attuned to what's happening in the consumer's minds, and they are experiencing lots of maybe not pain, but cramps at this point, that the market is not where it should be. So based on the report from Urban Nation, 40 projects that were slated to be released in 2023 actually got delayed. I'm not sure what that means, delaying a project from the builder's standpoint. Does it mean that they are hoping that the market is going to improve in a significant way in the first quarter or maybe two quarters of the year? Incidentally, RBC released a report last week where they were saying that we have likely reached the peak of the interest rates and if anything about mid-year the interest rates will go down by maybe a quarter point all right so then the following day we had the deputy governor of the bank of canada talking in the press conference that wait a second you know she's putting brakes on claims like that the elevated level of interest rates is here to stay so we might have a insignificant drop in interest rates by 25 basis points but we're still expecting to have 4.5 to 5% overnight rate from the Bank of Canada for the foreseeable future. So a 25 basis point drop ain't gonna do much. So you know what? Maybe the first quarter and the second quarter are not gonna be very different from the last quarter of this year. Then some of those projects might still get released to public in the hopes that something will happen in the public sentiment and people will start buying, or maybe they will get canceled altogether. And of course, our last hope is the government who, instead of fumbling their thumbs, is actually thinking about consumers with heartache and trying to improve affordability in Toronto for both renters and potential home buyers. Well, to that end, I want to switch over to this article on betterdwelling.com where they report that Canada invests $444 million with a company that says millennials don't want a home. Well, I'm not interested in the slant that this article is putting on the conversation where their focus is on the company, Tricon Capital. I want to focus on what actually the outcome of this money allocation is going to be. 
the total money allocated to uh, build rentals in Toronto is $1.2 billion. And 440 million of those funds were already slated to build a uh, rental building or maybe a set of buildings at 373 Front Street East. So it's worth noting that this project has been in the works for a few years, but now it seems to be getting a green light to move forward. So the total number of units that will be built is 855. And if you do simple math, it seems reasonable that um, each unit is going to cost $520,000. All right, so 855 units at the end. If we were to use up the whole budget allocated for rental buildings of $1.2 billion at $520,000 a piece, we'd be able to build 3,000 units. Is that good? Well, for reference, let me tell you that the annual number of immigrants settling in Toronto or the suburban areas is approximately 100 to 150,000, depending on a year. So it seems like this newly minted rental edition of the building at 373 Front Street East is going to be a flash in the pan. It's not going to change the situation significantly, or maybe it's not going to change it at all. And let's jump to the next article, also on betterdwelling.com. Canadian real estate prices slip further as sellers suddenly surge. Yeah, it is true. It does seem like the sellers have decided to jump on the bandwagon of selling all at the same time. And this trend started back in August, actually, of this year. Uh, we've seen that the inventory has been steadily growing since approximately that time. Which is especially true for condo owners and especially true for those that have purchased their units in the past couple of years. So it's worth talking about renewals right now, what's going to happen next year and to a degree a year after that. About a trillion dollars worth of renewals are coming into the Canadian market over the next couple of years. It seems that everybody knows that, but you can say that those renewals, so people renewing, will be broken down into three distinct categories. So one is that we're um, a consumer upon renewal will get approved and will be able to handle the monthly payments. So those people will not do anything. They will continue with their ownership as if nothing changed. The second category of people will not be able to renew because they will no longer qualify for a mortgage and they will have to either find an alternative source of actually financing the mortgage amount, which will probably be prohibitively expensive for them because they will have to resort to bill lenders or maybe private money. And the only alternative to that is actually to put the property up in the market and sell. And the third category out of the group is going to be people that will be able to renew, but they will not be able to handle monthly payments because they will be in for a sticker shock. In fact, RBC reported last week that about 60% of Canadians, when they will be faced with renewals, will be in for a massive sticker shock. For some people, their monthly payments will double. And that comes on the heels of more and more Canadians having to resort to using food banks. So about 7% of people that are lining up at food banks in Toronto are actually homeowners and 17% of those people there are employed. So this just gives you an additional dimension to help understand how much trouble the Canadian economy is in and how much suffering the Canadian consumers have to go through in order to survive in this marketplace. All right, so enough with the negative stuff. Let's talk about what we can do as consumers to improve our situation, to plan better, and to be better prepared for what's coming in this marketplace. As I mentioned earlier, the market had flatlined since August. The volume of inventory has gone up, the volume of sales has gone down, the prices are depressed, and this pattern is likely to continue into 2024. And even if there is um, a brief reprieve uh, with the Bank of Canada bringing the interest rates down by 25 basis points, any improvements we will have from that move will be quickly negated by all of the people that are planning to renew their mortgages in 2024. And if you recall, I already mentioned that those people renewing will be broken down into three distinct groups and only one of the three will be able to renew and continue the ownership of their properties. The remaining two will have to consider putting their properties up for sale. And if you are within those two groups that are thinking about putting their properties up for sale, I suggest that you increase your decision making time frame from two to three months to six to nine months. And the reason for that is that it takes about two to three months to sell a property, then about two to three months to actually close on it. And by the time you get paid, you're six months in. So people have a tendency to procrastinate with their decision making. It's best to have six to nine months as a buffer before you actually run out of money to make your mortgage payments on the property that you already have. 
If you're already on the market and you're trying to sell right now and nothing is happening as nothing is happening for most people that are trying to sell their condos at this point, you may want to consider three options that you may or may not have thought about. So number one is rent to own. This is something you can offer to your prospect buyers and you can either act as a bank for them or you can delegate that responsibility to a mortgage broker. So there's a bunch of programs that mortgage brokers are offering to that end and you would need to have that conversation with them to see if this is something for you. Of course, this would ideally work in a situation when you carry a low mortgage or maybe your property is paid off completely. Second option is offering to your potential buyers a VTB, a vendor take back financing. So on a million dollar property with a 200,000 down payment from the buyers, you can offer them an additional $200,000 as a VTB and then their mortgage obligation will be for $600,000 with the lending institution. You may or may not charge interest for what you're offering, depending on how you structure the deal, but that may be very appealing to some buyers. Again, this option will work best if you carry a low mortgage or you have no mortgage on the property at all. And the last thing for you to consider, you know, you can say it's innovative, but you could equally say that it's completely old school because there's been a lot of things like that happening in the 80s. That's what I hear an offer from the seller to the buyer, not from the buyer to the seller, but from the seller to the buyer, where you initiate the process in the hopes of engaging the buyer, continuing the negotiation and closing the deal. So that's for people that are thinking about selling or are already on the market trying to sell. Now I wanna talk about buyers. If you are in a lucky position where you stash some cash away and you're ready to explore what this market can offer, there's definitely a few things for you to consider with the first one being assignments. This has been often overlooked as if you were looking at repurchasing assignments from the original buyers even two or three years ago, you would have been looking at paying a substantial premium at over what they've paid. But now things have changed quite dramatically and we're reading articles that the original purchasers are walking away from their deposits of 200, 300, and even at the extreme, the article was citing $320,000. And it's not that the deposits are often that substantial. That's a lot of money. But what happens is that, say, if your deposit is $150,000 and you just want to waive the bill, the goodbye, and walk away from the deal, they may sue you. Because once they sell the property in two or three months' time, they can sue you for whatever the difference is between the sale price and the contractual price that you, by the way, were on a hook for to pay to them. And in addition to that, they have a bunch of expenses. They have the legal expenses, which are not going to be at a level of $1,000 to $1,500, which happens in a typical resale transaction. Those expenses will probably be closer to fifteen to twenty grand, And they will have real estate commission expenses as well that they will have to pay. And believe me when I say that, that will be coming out of your pocket because they will go after you. So assignment sales and people walking away from those assignments represent a great opportunity if somebody's over leveraged or cannot obtain a mortgage to close their transaction you can come in help them out actually and bail them out of the situation they're in an unfortunate position they will lose the deposit but at least they will not get sued they will wash their hands clean of that whole thing and they will move on with their life so explore assignments next opportunity i want to talk about is resale property with over leveraged sellers with the wave of renewals that is coming in, not everybody will be able to renew their five-year fixed mortgages. Some people will actually be forced to put their homes up on the market. And you can look for those options. You can negotiate those types of deals and you can help them get out of a sticky situation while at the same time getting a fantastic price for a home that you're purchasing, whether for yourselves or as an investment. And the last thing I want to bring up as an opportunity is that I would suggest if you're a buyer and you have some cash available to you that you intensify your efforts in searching for an opportunity over the months of December and the month of January. So the next two months are going to be quite crucial for you to get a property at the absolute lowest price point, probably over the course of an entire year. So as I mentioned in the very beginning, we're going to talk about the negatives, but we're also going to talk about the positives and the opportunities and the options that we have in this marketplace, both as sellers and as buyers. That's about it. I want to finish on this note. If you like the content, please hit the like button. Consider subscribing to the channel so that you don't miss any videos that are coming out every week. And I'm looking forward to seeing you again next week.